Before we start Q&A, I got something to say. This is for all the kin spooks and niggers you're kicking for. You stay the fuck out of our locker room. Fucking coming in and stealing shit. We should fucking lynch you. Fuck all of you. It's a privilege to be in our school. You fuckers going around like you own the place. Fuck all of you. Every single one of you stupid cunts. What is good, my people? We are live back again with another episode of The Forecast. Now, I don't understand why we pretend like we don't know who these people are by now. And most of it is probably because of fear. It's like no matter what they do to us, we act surprised, we're mad about it for a little while, and then we forgive them and move on. We can't even stay mad long enough to stop watching football. Meanwhile, they're in full-on attack mode. And they know they can harm us without any consequences. And they're going to keep doing it until we're ready to protect each other. Especially men protecting women and children. They understand we are at war. But we're willing to sacrifice our children in order to assimilate into their society. Just so we don't have to face them. But if we really understood their mindset, we wouldn't even want to be around them. Now, a lot of people know about the Little Rock Nine. And what they had to go through just to go to high school. But in New Orleans around the same time... Four six-year-old black girls integrated an all-white elementary school. Ruby Bridges was the first one to integrate, and she ended up going alone at six years old. Now, on the first day of school, she was escorted by four U.S. Marshals, and her mom went to school with her. Now, by the time she got to the school, Amar was already there, but she didn't know what was going on. She thought it was Mardi Gras. Now, when a six-year-old little girl was walking into school, these fully grown adults started yelling racial slurs at her, throwing things at her making death threats to her. And then after she got into the school, white parents came in and took every single white student out of the school. Most of the white women teachers, who we have teaching our children today, refused to even teach her. They had to bring in a teacher from Boston, and she was in the class alone by herself for the whole year. And of course, her mother couldn't go with her every single day. So after a while, she had to go alone. But instead of being scared, at six years old, she was praying for the mob who was making death threats against her. The mom was out there every single day she went to school. And every single morning, one white woman would threaten to poison her. Other people would do things like hold up a black baby doll inside of a coffin. Every single day, they spit on her, threw things at her, and threatened to lynch her. But she never showed any fear. And for her own safety, she could only eat lunch that she brought from home. And she couldn't even drink out the water fountain because they thought people had poisoned it. And there's a movie about Ruby Bridges. But three other black girls in New Orleans integrated another school at the same time. They became known as the McDonough Three. Just like Ruby Bridges, they had to be escorted through a white mob, yelling slurs at them and making threats. And white parents pulled their children out of the schools. They had the schools to themselves for a whole year and a half, which did end up being a lot safer because nobody else was in there with them. But every single day, Ahmad was outside threatening them, spitting on them, calling them niggas. They even pulled the dresses off these six-year-old girls as they tried to go into school. And one time, one of them got hit with a bat in the stomach. But they don't care if it's a six-year-old little girl because they understand we are at war. But they can hunt us down and shoot and kill us in our own home. And somehow, we still don't understand. In Texas, not long after the brother Joshua Brown was mysteriously murdered, after he testified in the Botham John case, Another sister, A. Tatiana Jefferson, was shot by Fort Worth police inside of her own home while she was playing video games with her nephew. So let's see how this sister could get shot in her own home by Fort Worth police.
my hands up. Show me your hands. Show me your hands. Tonight, we are seeing the face of A. Tatiana Jefferson, shot and killed in her home by a Fort Worth police officer early this morning. Now, we know a lot of you have questions about this case, and we have been working all day to find out what we can. This story begins on the south side of Fort Worth on East Allen Avenue. That is where our Eric Alvarez is live tonight to walk us through what happened. Well, friends and family are understandably outraged tonight. They are demanding answers. They are demanding justice for that young woman who was shot and killed here inside her own home by a police officer that was called here to see if she needed help. Put your hands up. Come here. A welfare check gone horribly wrong. In this body cam footage released by the Fort Worth Police Department, you do not hear the officer identify himself. As he passes a window and steps through a gate into the backyard, he then sees a figure in a window, draws his gun, and fires, less than three seconds after demanding to see the person's hands. That person is 28-year-old A. Tatiana Jefferson, who lived in the home with her 8-year-old nephew. The family is, is understandably brokenhearted. Attorney Lee Merritt, who spoke to Jefferson's family, says the pair were playing video games early in the morning. And they heard someone creeping around outside. She went to investigate at the window. An officer was on the other side who shot at commands, and before she had a moment to respond, he shot her to death. So how did this happen? Around 2.30 a.m. Saturday, Jefferson's neighbor noticed the door open and the lights on. He called a non-emergency line, asking for police to perform a welfare check. I'm still kind of broken and shocked. James Smith tells WFAA officers parked around the corner, arrived at the house with no lights, no sirens, and did not announce their presence. He called police so they would make sure Jefferson and her nephew were safe. He never expected police to put them in danger. They tell me I shouldn't feel bad, but I feel bad because had I not called the police department, she would probably still be alive today. So I do feel a little weight on me for that, making, that, making that call. Fort Worth police have not released the name of the officer, but describe him as a white man who has been with the department since April of last year. The officer has been placed on administrative leave. The department says all of the evidence will be handed over to the district attorney's office to see if any criminal charges will fall. And that is exactly what friends, family, and neighbors are calling for tonight. I can tell you throughout the day, dozens of people have stopped by this house offering support to the family of that young woman, which they say had every right to be in her own home and posed no threat to that officer. Live in Fort Worth, I'm Eric Alvin. Eric, thank you. Fort Worth Mayor Betsy Price sent out a statement in response to the shooting today, saying writing a statement like this is tragic and something that should never be necessary. A young woman has lost her life, leaving her family in unbelievable grief. All of Fort Worth must surround A. Tatiana Jefferson's family with prayers, love, and support. Chief Krause and his command staff are acting with immediacy and transparency to conduct a complete and thorough investigation. More details are forthcoming, and the Tarrant County District Attorney Law Enforcement Incident Team Office will ultimately receive this case. So at about 2 o'clock in the morning, the sister A. Tatiana Jefferson, neighbor called the non-emergency line because he thought his neighbor needed help because he saw the door was open and all the lights on. Now the neighbor who said he does regret calling because we cannot call these people for help. They are not there to help us. But he said he made it clear that it was a welfare check. And he wanted to make sure the elderly woman next door was okay. But this sister and her nephew was just up playing video games. Now, when the police pulled up, they parked down the street. They didn't turn their lights on. They didn't have any sirens on. And then without announcing themselves, they just start creeping around the property, whispering to each other. Now, these cops, who they refused to release their names, were supposed to be there for a welfare check. But they come with their guns already out. So this sister, hearing somebody creeping around outside, goes to the window to look. Then the cop said he saw a person standing by the window, and then without identifying himself, he just started saying, show me your hands, and then shot her at the same time. He shot this sister in her own home in front of an eight-year-old, and he claimed that she was the one that was the threat. Our top story tonight, a woman is dead after being shot and killed in her own home by a Fort Worth police officer. The shooting happened around 2.30 this morning in the 1200 block of East Allen Avenue, just to the east of 35W. Let's go straight to Nicole Jacobs, who is live at the scene. Nicole, you've been there all day. What can you tell us? 
Well, I can tell you when police first arrived here at the scene, residents tell me that they bypassed the two front doors, walked along the side of the home into the backyard where the shooting happened. Now, one thing community leaders, residents, and Fort Worth police all agree on is that law enforcement responded to this home for a well-being check, eye. but they don't agree on why police shot and killed their neighbor. She was the cool aunt who stayed up till 2 a.m. playing video games. And that's what 28-year-old Atiana Jefferson was doing in the overnight hours with her nephew. The hardest part about this is I spoke with an 8-year-old uh, who explained what it was like inside of the house. Just before 2.30, James Smith, a neighbor of the East Allen Avenue home, called the non-emergency Fort Worth police number when he saw his neighbor's doors ajar. And informed them that my neighbor was a elderly, sickly lady, and I was concerned for her health. But when police arrived, Smith recalls no lights, no sirens, no officers identifying themselves. Three or four tactical officers come from around the corner, seemed like. Walk across the street, go in front of her house, past the front doors, which were open, go down the side of her, her house to the rear of her house. And in less than a minute, I heard a gunshot. Fort Worth police confirm an officer shot and killed Jefferson. They followed up that information with a one minute, 20 second clip of body camera video. It shows officers moving along the side of the home into the backyard with flashlights shining and then this. Put your hands up, show me your hands. We went from a welfare check to a woman being killed by the cops. Shot through a screened window. Fort Worth officers later releasing images of a firearm inside the home. There was nothing nefarious or illegal about owning a firearm, and they presented in no way that that firearm was contributory towards the use of deadly force here. Community leaders and neighbors are rallying around the family who has declined to speak with the media, leaving it to activists to share their outrage. This is one I cannot swallow. We are not target price for nobody. But our voice is going to be heard this time. Jefferson was an Xavier University graduate working in medical cells, holding down the fort while her mother was in the hospital. And a neighbor, just trying to be a good neighbor, left feeling like this. I feel guilty because had I not called the Fort Peace Department, my neighbor would still be alive today. But with the demand for answers, justice, and a call for an independent investigation, many in the community say an indictment is the right call. That's murder. Through a statement, Fort Worth police say they are committed to transparency going on to say, in part, the officers observed a person standing inside the residence near a window perceiving a threat. The officer drew his deputy weapon and fired one shot, striking the person inside the residence. Officers entered the residence, locating the individual and a firearm. In the meantime, community activists are calling for a federal independent investigation. They also say they want the interim police chief to step down. Now, when the police went into the house, they claimed that they found a gun. Now, we're not even going to talk about how guns are legal in Texas, more so than other places, especially when you're inside your house and somebody creeping around outside. But they didn't say she was holding a gun. They didn't say she was near the gun. They didn't even say the gun was in the same room as her. They just had to throw it in there to try to criminalize this sister. They are going to stay on code and protect this cop at the same time and do everything they can to justify this murder. They only released parts of the body camera footage, but they still have the blue wall of silence and they won't say anything. Have yet to speak to the public in public about this case. And for some, it is eerily similar to what happened to Botham Jean, the unarmed man killed by a Dallas officer in his own apartment last year. Kevin Reese has been hearing from neighbors and faith leaders in Fort Worth. And Kevin, that anger seems to keep growing as we continue to learn more. It certainly, uh, certainly is at this point. And ministers and activists here in Fort Worth uh, say they cannot ignore the parallels to the Botham John case in Dallas. Only this time, an officer outside this home shooting through a window into the bedroom, killing a woman inside. And for them, the relative silence of the Fort Worth Police Department in these first 20 hours is deafening to them as well. Call on the police department to be totally transparent starting immediately to not hide anything, to not withhold anything from the community of Fort Worth. Uh, we're tired of this and it's going to stop. But in the first hours after the shooting, neighbors and activists say Fort Worth police is not 
being transparent, not telling them enough. If the officer is at fault, then the officer must suffer the consequences. Consequences a group of pastors told us they see is even worse than the Dallas case of Botham Jean. This time, the police took it a step further, and she was in her own place and shot and killed her. That is not only unacceptable, that's murder. Fort Worth police did release a portion of the body camera footage where you see a Tatiana Jefferson looking out the window at the officer milliseconds before he fired. And then police released a photo of a gun they found in the house and only mentioned it briefly with no context in their written press release. Didn't mention if she held a gun, didn't mention if the officer thought she had a gun. That angers this community even more. Don't paint this sister as no, as no villain. That's right. If you do that, if you paint this sister as a villain, this city going to have hell to pay. Mm -hmm. Don't paint the sister as no villain. They're the ones who murdered. They murdered her. Mm -hmm. And there's no excuse for it. But they're trained to, to, to get things that they're trained for, get things done all, not to go out and murder people. I'm not saying they murdered them, but it looked to me like they murdered them when I looked at the this right here. There are calls already for a federal investigation for the Texas governor to come to Fort Worth, for the officer to be fired and prosecuted immediately, and for the Fort Worth Police Department to start providing more answers. And we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we're going to keep on talking about this until justice happens. We're crying out to the Lord. Our only uh, recourse at this point is for God Almighty to hear our cry and come see about us. But again, the only information released by the Fort Worth Police Department at this point is that portion of the body camera footage and that written press release. But as you heard the mayor say that uh, more information is coming and we, of course, will keep pressing for more. Marie, back to you. Kevin, thank you. Now, we heard that anger echoed by many of you tonight on our Facebook page who are frustrated about the similarities of this case and the murder of Botham Sean. The trial for that fired Dallas police officer Amber Geiger ended just 10 days ago with a conviction and a 10 year sentence. Geiger was off duty, but still in uniform when she killed Jean inside his own apartment. Many in the community questioned how the police department handled that shooting and the ripple effects of that still have tensions running high. Now, this cop that they won't name got his paid vacation. And this sister, who was a pre-med graduate from Xavier, and that home taking care of her sick mother, and someone with no record, is murdered. And now we gotta wait for justice like we just finished waiting with Botham John. But we have to understand the situation that we are in. They are not trying to hide how they feel. They never have tried to hide it. And praying and forgiving and hoping something outside of yourself is gonna come and save you is not gonna happen. We have to realize we are the only ones that can save us. We are all we got. And until we realize that, then the same thing is going to keep happening. I'm going to say it so it's hurt. If you use the word nigga, you know, with an A at the end, that means something different. Let's get through this. If you put the A at the end of the word, it means the person who's a non-immigrant. It means gaining or growing achieving. Okay, so it has a different kind rotation to it. Now, if you use the R at the end, so I'm going to say it again, so I apologize if you find this offensive, but if they use the word nigger with an R, er, that is a racial slur. That is a racial slur. Okay, that is referred to people during the slave times. So when people were enslaved, if you were an African descent, that's the word they would use to describe you. Okay, it also is a derogatory term. I guess she's done cursing and screaming. Mm-hmm. Not even a little bit. Six figures a year, man. It's because I'm young and I'm black and the reason why you would say that. That's right, because you're black. Bobby on welfare. Not even a little bit. Don't even look like you got it. Not even a little bit. <laughs> I got a 3,200 square foot home. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You mad and nervous. Mad and Mad and nervous. Mad and nervous. I understand. I'm sorry. This situation can change real quick. You would you you better stay over there is what I'm going to tell you. You going to stay you better stay over. You better stay over there is what I'm going to tell you. Next tonight here, a middle school teacher's racist rant after a fender bender in the school parking lot. Here's Stephanie Ramos. Go back to your welfare. Tonight, a Pennsylvania middle school teacher has been suspended after her racist rant aimed at an African-American parent dropping off his child in the school's parking lot. Probably on welfare, too. Not even a little bit. Six figures a year, man. Because I'm young and I'm black, and the reason why you would say that. That's right, because you're black. The parent, who does not want to be identified, says it all stemmed from a minor fender bender in the parking lot of Drexel Hill Middle School. In the video, you see the teacher come out from around the truck and yell derogatory statements and a racial slur toward the parent. Tonight, the school district's superintendent speaking out. This is not the appropriate way to interact or to communicate with, with anybody in the public. As for the parent involved, he commends the district for how they're handling everything, adding that one teacher does not represent an entire school. I'm the only one picking on them. I just walk around the room and it's like just pick on them. Because they're black. And they're the only fucking niggers doing any work. I don't, I know. I'm sorry. I'm tired. No, no, no. no. That's, what, that's what you've been saying. Is that you, she's repeating what you're saying. But, I'm sorry. I know. You are about to hear the voice of a staff member at Highland Park Middle School. The language is alarming. Because they're black. And they're the only fucking doing any work. This cell phone video surfaced on social media Wednesday. Students call the woman talking a social studies teacher. She's saying that she targets black people and that she's calling out. A word too tough for Ayanna Allison to repeat. You don't have to say the word. Effing N words and. Nevea Suttle was another student involved. It was very shocking to me when the teacher did say it because I've never been called the N word before. The first post we saw had more than 25,000 views. Brandy Coleman, Ayana's mom, shared it. She said Facebook has removed the video. People were forwarding me a video on, from Facebook last night, um, and they said this was an incident from Highland Park. I remember my daughter mentioning what happened to her earlier in the day was recorded. To know that I send her out somewhere that she's supposed to be safe every day and she's not, to know that she's being badgered and being targeted and no one was there to advocate for her, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that I didn't know the magnitude of the situation so that I could intervene before that video. The district responded Thursday. I, like many others, am very disturbed by the racist language that was captured on video in one of our schools. No matter the situation, foul and racist language has no place in SPPS. As educators, we have to be held to a higher standard. Now, many wondering what led to this. Basically, the video is the boiling point of issues between her and my daughter from October till yesterday. There was one point where she came home and she's like, Mom, she called us a bunch of ints. And I just, I couldn't believe that. Those Negroes, or you Negroes, Calling her a Negro? Yes. And so she would come home and she would tell me that, Mom, the teacher's using the N-word. And I'm just like, no, there's no way this is happening. You know, Ayana, is she using it at you or is she using it for the curriculum? Like, I understand what she was teaching. She's like, Mom, we're beyond that now. The district says that employee is now on administrative leave. We will not fall silent in the face of racism in our schools. And we will not make excuses for the harm this causes the children that you place in our care. I apologize to you, and I can assure you that we are taking appropriate actions and conducting a thorough review of this situation. An Irving ISD middle school teacher is on leave tonight after using inappropriate language during an assembly for a group of seventh graders. It happened Friday at Irving's Lady Bird Johnson Middle School. Fox 4 Sean Rabb takes us inside that assembly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twenty. 
This is the video sent to us by someone inside the character building assembly for seventh graders at Lady Bird Johnson Middle School. The two teachers playing a word association game. On the right, teacher Amber Collis. Listen to this exchange. Crocs, courage, lions, blood, loyalty, guts, You heard right. The second year teacher, Amber Collis, drops the N word. Listen again. Loyalty, guts, As the crowd reacts, the teacher playing the word game covers her mouth and walks away. Collis takes the mic from the man in the maroon shirt and tries to quiet the crowd and get their attention. The video stops. Obviously, the students and staff were surprised and shocked by what they heard. The principal wasn't present in the character building session, but the principal did meet with the staff afterwards, and they talked about their feelings. In a statement, the district writes, During a seventh grade assembly, a regrettable situation occurred. The school and district officials do not condone or approve of such language. We can reassure our families that we have taken personnel action. Staff members talked with students face to face after the incident and the principal sent a letter with her staff saying she would love for the incident to not have occurred. Now the school, she says, must pull together in love. We made several visits to the teacher's home hoping to give her the opportunity to explain, but we were not able to reach her today. A Jackson County school is defending its decision tonight to block an eight-year-old girl from getting her picture taken because of her hair. The principal says her red extensions violated school policy, but her father tells News 10's Nicole Buckman there's more to it than just her hair. Yeah, Marion Scott told me she cried and felt singled out when she wasn't allowed to have her school photo taken. Now her father is trying to get answers through his own tears. It, it it's upsetting, you know. Mary and Scott's baby picture proudly hangs on her parents' wall for all to see. But her third grade picture is missing since she was denied a school picture last week because of the red in her hair. So her hair is done in a bun. It's braided into a bun. This is uncalled for to pull them to the side. They didn't even call us. Marion didn't leave out the house, go down the street and go get this done on her own. She's eight years old. We did this ourselves in our own home. I mean, there's just no way that I felt like this would happen. The Paragon Charter Academy handbook says that students' hair color must be natural tones to get their picture taken. But what it doesn't state is the course of action if a student shows up with colored hair, leaving Doug confused and frustrated when Marion was told she couldn't get her picture taken but could return to class. If they at least would have reached out to us and said, hey, come get her, she's got a hair issue, we need you to change it, that's not allowed, I can show you in the handbook. They didn't even go to those extents. They let her stay in school. So if she's not a disruption to the class, then why is she a disruption to the picture? The school did send out a recorded message Sunday before photos were taken going over the dress code policy, a message Doug says he never heard or saw. Had I seen the email, I probably would have told Latoya, hey, don't even, don't even do it, even if it's school color. I think it's good that this happened because now people are going to get the opportunity to take a look at what's really going on. Now, I reached out to the school today and the principal told me students with a hair color or style violation are given a week or so to get it corrected, which is why Marion remained in class. Her family has no plans to send Marion to a different school, but they would like to see better communication from the Paragon administrators in the future. All right, Nicole, thank you. Marion did attend school this morning for the first time since that incident with all black hair. Her family plans on getting her picture taken on retake day, which is November 12th. A student trapped in a bathroom and hit with racial slurs. I'm Jay Crawford. Russ is off. And I'm Sarah Shookman. No one is denying that that's what happened at Hudson High School on Friday. And today the school system is taking action to make sure it never happens again. Our Romney Smith joins us live in Hudson tonight with the school's plan. Romney, good evening to you. Good evening. The principal of Hudson High School says racist language will absolutely not be tolerated and that any victims should come forward to let them know. And that's a message that the superintendent fully supports. When the superintendent of Hudson City Schools, Phil Herman, was alerted about a racist incident involving multiple female students, he was upset. I'm appalled anytime a student doesn't feel safe or supported in, in school. He addressed it in a robocall over the weekend, alerting parents to an investigation then sent a longer robocall Monday detailing the incident that included racially offensive language, preventing a student from leaving a restroom where the incident occurred and threatening social media posts. 
I sat down with him today to ask questions about it. There are differing levels of culpability on the detail our investigation showed, and there are differing um, consequences um, for the students uh, involved. I also asked about the school's atmosphere. Do you believe Hudson High School is a welcoming atmosphere for specifically African American students? Uh, uh, I want Hudson High School to be um, a welcoming atmosphere for, for all students. Um, I need to engage in a, um, and our administration needs to engage further with all of our students, including our African American students, and get that perspective um, from them. Moving forward, Mr. Ehrman says the school system will continue diversity training, bring in speakers to talk about race, and initiate small group conversations with every single high school student. But it's very clear that we need to continue those efforts, expand upon those efforts, and we need to involve students now in, uh, in more detail uh, with uh, diversity, diversity training. He has two main goals right now, making sure the victim is fully supported and making sure all students learn a lesson. No, there's no place for, for that today. Um, there's no place for racially offensive language today. There is no tolerance uh, for, uh, and there will be consequences, and the consequences vary de um, depending on the set of, of circumstances, but there will be consequences. Alan, thank you. An outraged parent is demanding action tonight over an offensive comment he says a teacher made to his daughter and other black students. Seven, seven Action News reporter Rudy Harper is live outside Clawson Middle School tonight where this happened. And Rudy, what does his father want? Well, Dave, this father is extremely upset. He once said teacher fired here at Clawson Middle School. She's been an educator for nearly three decades, and he says she was back inside the classroom on Wednesday after just a slap on the wrist. Those kids, yeah, I hurt for them. This father outraged and demanding his daughter's seventh grade science teacher be fired for her offensive remark to students. This one teacher, Miss Smith, comes up to my daughter's group, who is all black kids, and says, I know it's you know, customary in your culture to be loud. I'm gonna need you to cut it out. Winston Hughes says his 12-year-old daughter and classmates were offended. She was hurt. You know, she didn't say, say anything in the classroom, but once she got in the car, I could tell just by talking to her, she was like, that wasn't right. Why would she say that to us? We went to Superintendent Tim Wilson's office for answers. He spotted me, and 15 minutes later, another district employee told me he wasn't available for comment. We had already left him a voicemail. Why do you think the superintendent refused to talk with us about this tonight? Quite honestly, I think he does not want the attention. We sent Wilson another email requesting comment and followed up with an email to the school board and trustees. Wilson did not want to go on camera, but called to say the teacher is a veteran of 28 years and was apologetic and remorseful. He also said the teacher has a clean record. Hughes says that teacher called him personally. She went on to tell me, and I found it comical later, but she went on to tell me that my daughter has a black friend and she brought him to the, our dinner table. If you, have to just, if you have to justify the fact that you have, your daughter has a black friend that you allowed at your dinner table, what are you telling me, ma'am? He just wants his daughter to be the best she can be. I told her, when you go in that classroom, you shine. Be the child of God and the daughter that I raised you to be. You still have not told myself or the community what are you prepared to do. Right now at 10, a parent is asking tough questions of school administrators over what they're prepared to do to fight a controversial teacher's reinstatement while dealing with other issues involving race. Good evening, I'm Jessica Cartalia. Yuki is off tonight. We're learning that some changes may be in store. Eyewitness News reporter Kimberly Davis joins us live from Pensgrove to explain. Kim? Jess, good evening. As it stands right now, the school district cannot legally fire the science teacher, but at a school board meeting tonight, administration says it is doing everything in its power to get him out. It's toxic, intolerable, and has no place in our district. This is how the Pensgrove Carney's Point Regional School District described the language that a Pensgrove Middle School science teacher is accused of using. Bruce Bassetti remains on administrative leave after allegedly muttering the N-word under his breath while in the classroom on February 27th. Accusations Bassetti denies and a state arbitrator ruled for the seventh grade teacher 
to keep his job. The board collectively stands by the position to fight to seek to vacate this appalling and offensive decision. The school board is now seeking to vacate the arbitration award in Superior Court, something the NAACP president of Salem County was happy to learn. As long as they continue to do what they're supposed to do, everything's going to be good. But even with the school board's attempt to appeal the decision, one parent wants more to be done. It's time for you to get up out that office and start dealing with the issues in the school board. Madam President, you can bang that gavel all you want. I don't care. Hudson tells us the school board needs to do a better job of vetting teachers. The superintendent says she'll continue to fight for her students. We do what will be necessary to protect and safeguard our students. It's unclear how long it will take for the Superior Court to make a decision, but for now, Bassetti will not be teaching in any classroom. The parents of a young boy in Sanford are furious after an administrator at their son's elementary school called him the N-word. Good evening, I'm Amanda Hill in for Cindy Williams. I'm Pat Callahan. The nine-year-old boy who is biracial told his mother it happened during school and the district superintendent is confirming that it did. New Center Maine's Shannon Moss spoke with the parents and the superintendent today, and she's here now to tell us more about what happened. Well, Pat and Amanda, this incident happened on September 27th. Jessica Gowan says she got a call from Katherine Davis, the assistant principal at her son's school, saying her son was having trouble with some students, and Davis wanted him to switch to another class. But when Gowan asked her son about what happened at school, she says she was shocked to hear his answer. It's definitely fun, outgoing, plays football, wrestling. But lately, Jessica Gowan says her nine-year-old son, Javon, isn't acting like himself. My son does not feel comfortable at that school. Ever since, Gowan says Javon was called the N-word by the assistant principal at Willard School in Sanford, where Javon is a fourth grader. Gowan and Javon's father, Neil Jarrett, say their son admitted to assistant principal Katherine Davis that he was picking on a classmate, but that he was just joking around. Javon's parents say Davis then asked Javon, what if I called you the N-word and was just joking around? How would that make you feel? Javon's parents were shocked. Now every day is at school, I, I'm kind of worried about him. The school district is confirming what happened. But it's something at the time that uh, we take seriously. It's something that's not okay. Superintendent Matt Nelson would not say who was speaking to Javon because it's a personnel matter, but says the person was trying to explain to Javon that words hurt, but in the end, it backfired. At the end of the day, we screwed up. We made a mistake. Um, I also think the context of that is important. And when you understand the context, um, I think at the end of the day, it doesn't make it any better. Uh, but at the same time, it helps to understand it. Javon's father says he doesn't understand Davis's intentions. Following the incident, they had a meeting along with Javon. And while Davis did apologize, Javon's dad says she continued using the N-word and upsetting Javon. Javon, I'm sorry, I call you a n Like, she's just keep using this n word, n word. Superintendent Nelson says the district is confident it is addressing this issue internally. But Javon's parents say that's not enough. I'm disgusted in the school. Superintendent Nelson says, well, he can't talk about specifics. He did say in cases as important and serious as this, there is proper discipline, educational component, and also a restorative piece as well. Javon's parents say they feel the school and the district have not done enough. They would like to see Davis in the very least suspended and have asked that she have zero contact with their son. We have a teacher that just recently was like, you nigger. <laughs> He's been moved down to who? another student. To a student. And the, t the teacher has been demoted, but it's still teacher. Are you Alyssa Ploshnik? What do you have to say about uh, students being called the N word uh, in your school district? Do you, have you ever referred to a student as the N word, or has anybody you know referred to a student as the N word in Passaic? Has anybody ever used the N-word against a student in your school district? Good afternoon, Dr. Everett speaking. Yes, Dr. Everett, how are you doing today? Okay, and you? I have a, I have a special needs child that goes, to, um, that goes to school three over there, and uh, my son came home one day and told me that he was called the N-word by one of his teachers, and I, I honestly just need to know what your policy is regarding uh, students being called the N-word or teachers. Oh, no, that, that, that's students definitely unacceptable. It's definitely unacceptable. What is your policy regarding teachers that call black it, kids the word? It's totally, it's totally unacceptable. It's totally unacceptable. 
Okay, and, so are they going to uh, be allowed to keep their job and keep teaching the same children they keep calling? Well, the well, I'm not. I'm not going to say that the teacher would be fired immediately, sir. Um, that's not usually how it works. What what usually happens is um, a due process. We'll call. We'll call the. Uh, we'll call the teacher in, have a conference, and then decide on what the disciplinary measures will be. Uh, but certainly, certainly, if the expectation is that he or she is going to be fired immediately uh, with the contractual and everything stipulations, no, we won't be able to do that. Okay, to, so you're saying you're saying that if an investigation finds out that he or she said the N word, that she can still stay on as a teacher? That's possible. Yes, yes that's that's very possible. Yes. Uh, we cannot just walk in and fire a, a tenured teacher, a tenured teacher. Sir, has this ever happened before? Has has a teacher ever used unprofessional be, uh, language before? Yes. Has the Whether, teacher ever been fired for that? No, sir. No, no sir. Has the not, teacher not been... Just, not just specifically sir, sir, unprofessional I don't, language. I don't want to go back and forth with you because N-word. you only want to hear N-word. one thing, sir. Used on my child, sir. You want to hear one thing, that the teacher is going to be fired. Now... Uh, the teacher will not be fired. I, what can happen is um, your child could be, if, if you like, your child could be transferred to another class. Um, a tenured teacher, a tenured teacher, it's going to take um, um, a, a, a months, year, uh, probably at least a year to remove a tenured teacher, at least a year, a tenured teacher from the classroom. Just in case this teacher does have a mindset of retaliation for what my child has reported was said to him, being, being the, the N-word nigger being used towards him. Is there no way that you can just quietly move my child before all this begins? Because I don't want him targeted. Yes, can yes. We can remove the child, certainly. Go ahead and move him out and get him out of the situation quietly. You can protect your teacher all you want. You can, you know, reprimand them, you know, on the side or whatever. But... Keep it quiet. It doesn't matter. You know, go ahead and do that. But I want my child out of the situation where there's a teacher calling him the N-word. Very good. And what's your child's you name? You don't, you don't have to reprimand the teacher. Just move my child out of there quietly. Is that okay? That's Nobody not resolved. Okay. That's sure. That's not resolving the problem, though. But, but is that um, okay, though? That's okay. Because, I mean, I don't, okay. Because I don't want any more trouble for my child, so... Since that's okay, nobody's going to know. We're all on a group text, all the hosts and some of our bosses. And on Sunday when the story broke, I said to you guys, if they say it was a black guy and street related, I'm calling Sam Cook conspiracy. If people don't start to go down for this BS, BS, no one is safe. No one. This is so fishy to me, and it's so predictable. I knew this was going to happen. Let's just talk about this. So apparently, it was a drug deal gone wrong. We're talking about marijuana. Marijuana people, okay? So you're telling me that three men from Louisiana, they didn't say what part, but from the border to Dallas is a three-hour drive. You drove three hours to Dallas where marijuana isn't legal in any capacity, not medicinal, not recreational. Recreational, but you know where marijuana is legal? Louisiana. Yeah. It's medicinally legal, wow. which means that it would have been far easier for yeah. them to go down the street yep. to get the, the weed than to drive to Dallas to go with a man who is high profile at that to purchase marijuana pounds, in too. Dallas. Yeah. Oh, and then, no, yes, they, found 12 they pounds. said they Give found 12 pounds. Yeah. They found $4,000. Right. Do you know I could pick up the phone right now and yeah. probably ha- contact more people who could get access to 12 pounds of marijuana wow. than not? Yeah. Because there's a reason why it's called weed people, because that's how it grows, like weed. Yes. Marijuana is literally everywhere. So no one is being executed like mafioso style right. because of marijuana. And so coincidentally, right after after this trial, after right this after the trial, all over the the evening news, and not only that, but marijuana street value has actually gone down because right, it everywhere. is so right, 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 everywhere. Right. Everybody's growing it, so I think that 
When the family asked for an independent investigation, get it. that was paramount yeah. to this entire situation because without it, we don't have anyone to trust. It's like my dad told me when I was a little girl, you will have my respect and I will trust and believe you until you give me a reason not to. And that is going to be a long, high mountain to climb to get that back. And that's the problem with the authorities in Dallas right now. Right. We don't believe you because right. it just doesn't ring true. Well